When Charles Heisler revealed his locomotive, railroad investors called it the most idiotic thing ever built. Engineers scoffed. It looked nothing like the powerful Baldwin steamers that ruled American tracks. But within a few years, this so-called disaster would conquer terrain where the industry's best machines failed, helping loggers reach forests no engine ever had. How did ridicule transform into a railroad revolution? And why did every expert get it so wrong? Conventional steam locomotives, the pride of Baldwin and American Locomotive Company, were built for power and speed on straight level rails. Their massive steel frames and rigid wheelbases worked perfectly across the smooth main lines that connected America's cities and factories. But in the wilderness, these same strengths turned into fatal weaknesses. Logging companies, desperate to reach timber deep in the mountains, faced a different world. Their tracks twisted through forests, hugged the sides of steep hills, and crossed makeshift wooden trestles that might last a season before being abandoned. Standard engines struggled from the moment their wheels touched these lines. The long, unyielding frames of rod locomotives forced every axle to follow the same path, so even a gentle bend in the rails could send wheels climbing over the track. On temporary curves as tight as 95 feet in radius, derailments became routine. Engineers tried slowing to a crawl, but the risk never disappeared. Steep grades proved just as punishing. Where mainline trains rarely saw more than a 2% incline, logging routes demanded climbs of 6% or even 10%. Conventional engines, designed for gradual hills, lost traction and stalled. Their driving wheels spun uselessly, unable to grip the rails. Even when they managed to move, the engine's enormous weight pressed down on fragile wooden trestles, threatening collapse with every loaded run. More than one bridge gave way beneath a standard locomotive, sending tons of steel and timber crashing into ravines below. Maintenance crews fought a losing battle. Each trip over rough, hastily laid rail battered the machinery. Side rods bent, axles twisted, and bearings wore out faster than parts could be replaced. The cost of keeping these engines running on logging lines soared. Timber companies faced a choice spend fortunes building permanent, carefully graded tracks through the wilderness, or accept that half their engines would sit wrecked and useless by season's end. The engineers who designed these machines followed the logic of the main line. They believed in efficiency, in the elegance of straight rails and gentle curves. But in the woods, that logic broke down. The terrain demanded something different, something that could bend and flex with the track, climb impossible grades, and survive on rails that might shift with the next rainstorm. By the early 1890s, the limits of conventional power were clear. The logging industry needed a locomotive that could do what the standard engines simply could not. In August 1894, a locomotive unlike any other rolled out of the Stearns Manufacturing Company shops in Erie, Pennsylvania. It was a gamble, two cylinders set at a sharp 45-degree angle beneath the boiler, a drive shaft running down the center, gears hidden away from the grit and mud. The men who built it had heard the laughter from the old guard, but now the real test began, far from the factory floor. The prototype's destination was a logging operation deep in the Appalachian foothills, where the mountains pressed close and the tracks barely clung to the hillsides. On arrival, the crew eyed the machine warily. Some had spent years coaxing rod locomotives through the woods, watching them derail or stall on every sharp bend. This new engine looked nothing like what they knew, shorter and odd in its proportions, with a low, purposeful stance. That morning, the loggers loaded the first train. The track ahead twisted through hairpin curves, climbing grades that hit 6%, even 8%. Those slopes had chewed up and spat out the best efforts of Baldwin and American Locomotive Company. The rails themselves were rough, laid in a hurry, spiked to whatever ground was flat enough to hold them. Every man watching knew the ODDS. No one expected the Heisler to last the day. The engineer eased open the throttle. 
Steam hissed, gears clicked, and the locomotive began to move. Where a rod engine would have lurched and bucked, the Heisler rolled forward with a steady, even pull. It rounded the first hairpin without hesitation, trucks pivoting smoothly, all wheels driving. On the steepest grades, the V-twin cylinders dug in, sending power through the drive shaft to every axle. The train climbed without slipping. Log cars followed, groaning under their loads, but nothing gave way. Men along the line whooped and hollered as the engine crested the summit, the first locomotive they had seen make it up without stopping for sand or backing down in defeat. Word spread fast. By midday, loggers and foremen from nearby camps had gathered to watch the machine tackle the worst stretches, sharp switchbacks, sagging trestles, rails that shifted underfoot. The Heisler took them all in stride, its motion smoother and quieter than any of its rivals. Skepticism turned to awe. Old timers, who had scoffed at the design, now crowded around peppering the crew with questions. Some walked the track behind the train, searching for broken spikes or bent rails, but the line held. The Heisler's weight was balanced. Its force spread evenly, leaving the rails intact. For the first time, it seemed possible to reach timber that had always been out of bounds. By sundown, the engine had hauled more logs in a single day than most crews managed in a week. The proof was undeniable. What had started as a punchline in the shops of Erie ended as a triumph in the mountains. The men who witnessed that run carried the story home of a machine that defied the experts and conquered the impossible. The laughter had stopped. In its place was a new respect and the first spark of something bigger, a revolution in the way America moved its forests. Charles Heisler's breakthrough began with a question no other locomotive engineer had bothered to ask. What if the engine itself could be made to balance the chaos of rough mountain rails instead of fighting against it? The answer took shape beneath the boiler, a pair of steam cylinders not upright or in line as tradition demanded, but set at a bold 45 degree angle forming a V beneath the heart of the machine. This V-twin arrangement was not just for show. Each piston fired outwards and down, their forces perfectly opposed. So the entire engine rocked in harmony instead of shaking itself apart. Every pulse of steam was countered by its twin, keeping the locomotive steady, even as the rails twisted and dipped beneath it. From those cylinders, Power flowed not through the familiar maze of side rods and cranks, but into a single central drive shaft running the length of the frame. This shaft was the backbone of the Heisler, spinning inside a protective housing that kept out the mud and grit of the forest. At each end, a set of bevel gears took the shaft's rotation and split it cleanly between the locomotive's trucks, the wheel assemblies that carried the frame. Instead of driving just a handful of wheels, the Heisler system powered every axle. No wheel was left to slip idly on wet rails or loose bark. The engine's force was spread evenly, gripping the track with all its weight. The genius of the design lay in its simplicity. The 45-degree V-twin kept the engine's center of gravity low and stable, reducing the side-to-side -side sway that plagued conventional locomotives on uneven ground. The central shaft meant the locomotive could be shorter and more flexible, able to snake around curves that would derail a rigid framed engine in seconds. And because the gears were fully enclosed, they kept working through rain, snow, and the endless dust of the logging camps, where exposed rods and linkages would grind themselves to pieces in a matter of weeks. Heisler's own patent drawings, filed in 1892 and still studied by engineers today, show the clarity of his vision. The cylinders canted inward drive a crankshaft that turns the main drive shaft. Bevel gears at each truck split this motion, turning it 90 degrees to spin the axles. In the two truck models, side rods connect the inboard wheels on each truck so every wheel shares the load. The result is a locomotive that moves with the track, not against it. One that can flex, climb, 
and twist through the wildest terrain without losing its grip. This was not just mechanical bravado. The balanced forces of the V-twin meant less wear and tear on the track and the locomotive itself. The central shaft and enclosed gearing kept out debris, slashing maintenance downtime. And with every wheel driven, the Heisler could haul heavy loads up grades that left other engines spinning helplessly. It did not matter that the design looked odd or violated the rules of mainline engineering. In the unforgiving world of logging railroads, what mattered was traction, reliability, and the ability to keep moving when everything else stopped. Heisler's power core delivered all three. Every axle beneath the Heisler was alive with power. Unlike the rod locomotives that struggled to push force to just a few wheels, the Heisler's design sent torque from its V-twin cylinders into a central drive shaft running the length of the frame. At each end, a set of bevel gears split that motion, feeding it directly into both trucks. The real trick was in how each truck was built, a flexible assembly rather than a rigid block. The wheels were tied together with side rods so every axle shared the work. No wheel spun uselessly, no part of the locomotive was left behind on a slick rail or a shifting tie. This all-wheel drive was not just a technical boast. On the ground, it meant the Heisler could tackle curves as tight as a three-foot radius, bend so sharp most engines would derail before their second axle cleared the turn. Where standard locomotives needed broad sweeping arcs and careful grading, the Heisler slipped through hairpins and switchbacks like a snake. The trucks pivoted beneath the frame, letting the locomotive bend with the track instead of fighting it. Temporary rails laid in a hurry across uneven ground became passable. Fragile wooden trestles built to last a season could hold up under the Heisler's even weight, because the force was spread out through every wheel. Grades that would stop a rod engine cold, 6%, 8%, even 10% became routine. The gear train hidden inside a protective casing took the raw punch of the V-twin and turned it into smooth, steady pull. On a steep climb, all six or eight wheels dug in at once. There was no single point of failure, no axle left to slip while the rest strained. The Heisler's adhesion, its grip on the rails, was unmatched. Log trains that once had to be split into short, cautious sections could now be hauled in a single run straight up the mountain. The mechanical clarity of the design stood out in every detail. The flexible trucks soaked up the worst the track could offer, pivoting and shifting as the rails twisted beneath them. The side rods kept the axles turning in perfect sync so the locomotive moved as a single coordinated machine. Even the gear housings played their part shielding the moving parts from mud, bark, and sawdust that would grind down a conventional engine in weeks. Every trip over rough rail was a kind of proof. The Heisler did not just survive where others failed, it thrived. Its all-wheel drive and flexible trucks turned impossible routes into everyday work. The mountains, with their sharp curves and brutal grades, became part of the job. For the first time, Railroads could go where the timber was, not just where the land allowed. The Heisler's engineering made that freedom possible, one powered axle at a time. Accountants with sharpened pencils and stacks of ledgers became the unlikely champions of Heisler's locomotive. For them, every foot of track and every log hauled boiled down to numbers, profit, loss, and return on investment. Timber tracks deep in the mountains once written off as unreachable, now showed up on company balance sheets as pure opportunity. The value of a single untouched stand could reach $50,000, even $100,000, a fortune in the 1890s, and an even bigger one when multiplied across the forests of Appalachia and the Pacific Northwest. Conventional locomotives demanded permanent, carefully graded lines an investment that could swallow 40% more capital than a temporary route. Building those lines meant months of labor, tons of steel, and a commitment to a single patch of forest 
until every tree was gone. The Heisler changed that equation. That meant flexibility. Its ability to snake through rough terrain on hastily laid track meant companies could lay rails quickly, harvest the timber, then pull up the line and move to the next stand. The same locomotive could serve job after job, spreading its cost over years and miles instead of being stranded on a single route. Operating costs shifted too. Maintenance crews spent less time patching up derailed engines or rebuilding collapsed trestles. Heisler's even weight distribution and flexible trucks spared the track, letting companies run heavier loads and more frequent trains without constant repairs. When the ledgers closed at the end of each season, the numbers told a simple story. The so-called idiotic machine turned out to be the smartest investment a logging operation could make. Orders began arriving at Stearns Manufacturing in Erie almost as soon as the first Heisler locomotive proved itself on mountain rails. By the late 1890s, the factory floor was filled with frames and boilers in every stage of assembly each destined for a logging camp somewhere deep in the forests of Appalachia, the Pacific Northwest, or beyond. Word of Heisler's performance traveled quickly. Logging bosses who had watched rod engines fail on their lines now demanded the new geared design for their own operations. Production kept pace for a while, but as the stories of impossible climbs and tight turns spread, the backlog grew. By 1900, Stearns was struggling to fill orders fast enough to satisfy the surge in demand. Competitors took notice. Lima's Shea locomotive and the Climax, both geared types, had entered the scene earlier, but Heisler's unique V-twin and drive shaft arrangement set it apart. Rival manufacturers scrambled to refine their own designs, but Heisler's balance and all-wheel drive made it the machine of choice for the toughest jobs. The company responded with new models and, in 1897, patented a three-truck variant for even heavier loads. This allowed operators to run longer trains and tackle steeper grades without sacrificing traction or reliability. The patented design expanded capacity and confidence among operators. By the turn of the century, Heislers were working in nearly every major timber region in the United States. The order books reflected not just a fad, but a shift in what railroads expected from their locomotives. From the hills of West Virginia to the redwoods of California, the so-called idiotic engine had become the backbone of mountain railroading. The very features that once drew laughter now drove a production boom as the industry rushed to keep up with the new standard. Today, rail innovation still faces skepticism from industry experts and investors who prize convention over adaptability. Yet, as climate, terrain, and technology keep shifting, solutions that look unorthodox are often what drive progress. The railroads that once dismissed the impossible now rely on the legacy of so-called folly. Disruption rarely looks wise. It can seem reckless, until it changes the route for everyone. What idea are we underestimating right now?